It sits in a neighborhood where the sidewalk never seems to end, a modest one-story house on Olive Street in Burbank, chalk drawings on its tiny porch and a screen door over its real door. But this house is not what it seems. I'm Katie Chen for KPFK News with a special report on a family struggle with toxic mold. So people can understand this better. Um, they can think of this as um, analogous to anthrax in some ways because although anthrax is a bacterium it uh, produces a spore just like uh, these molds that we're talking about and how it does its injury is through toxins uh, just like we're talking about with these molds so you know what you're reading about anthrax is is, uh, somewhat analogous to what we're doing with the molds. Dr. Gary Ordog is a toxicologist and is one of a handful of doctors in the United States with an expertise on molds. He got a lot of experience with molds from military training and research. And he's also treating Richard Arsenault, who found the house in Burbank and had the unfortunate luck of moving in in late June of 1999. Well, when I first moved into the house, I had um, moved in for the purpose of <clears throat> having a, a place that I could live in um, that would allow the children to have a backyard and in the Burbank housing market it's very very competitive and uh, buying a house was still about a year and a half two years away and so I needed a place where the kids could stay in their same school district stay in the same school because that was important to me and basically be able to play outside and be little boys and not have to be cooped up in an apartment and um, the house itself appeared you know real nice it was quaint it was built in 1932 all of the walls were freshly painted and spackled. I noticed pretty much immediately two things about the house that were bizarre. One was that the, all the walls were covered with patched up cracks, but they were well patched up. In other words, I mean, the cracks were there, but it didn't look like uh, anything was leaking through them to the eye. The second thing was that there were hardwood floors in the house, and the hardwood floors in the front of the house, the south part, were nice and finished and shiny and lacquered. But on the north part of the house, where all the bedrooms were, the uh, flooring was sort of falling apart, and it was um, it, it had little patches of of um, oh I don't know it had rough patches all over it. It looked like it had been water damaged from years of use. And other than that, um, it seemed like it was a good deal for me. But then he started developing allergies and other symptoms he never had before. I thought I was suddenly allergic to um, hay fever or something like that. <clears throat> so my doctor prescribed Claritin. And uh, when I started having massive sneezing attacks and, you know, I'd walk around with a towel around my neck just to to facilitate my sneezing, um, I I realized that either I had started to become older or something around me was making me allergic. In fact, I thought it was the trees or, or something. I thought it was the hillsides of Burbank that hadn't affected me when I lived five blocks away, you know, just prior to that. But suddenly maybe I was getting old or something. He's 37 years old, and he was sick all the time, and even developed pneumonia. It also affected one of his sons, although he didn't realize what it was at the time. One of my sons, Jonathan, started, um, his behavior started just spinning completely out of control in the classroom, and we didn't know what it was. We didn't know there was any correlation at the time. In the spring, we got a team of um, experts to to assess uh, my son, and we actually got a separate team to assess me because I was suffering from what had become sort of severe fibromyalgia in all my joints and muscles. And I wasn't able to hold my memories and my thoughts anymore. And my personality was slowly starting to change. It was very, very disturbing and strange. I even talked to my doctor about it. About, and I told him I wasn't depressed. I wasn't suffering from depression. But I'm suffering some of the symptoms of depression. I have memory loss. I have moodiness that's getting worse and worse. Jonathan was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. Arsenault took Jonathan to a doctor who prescribed Adderall, which burned off the buildup of serotonin in his brain. His other son got sick too, becoming frail, falling asleep in class all the time, and the once gifted child was just not doing as well as he used to. Then his sons went to visit their biological mother for the summer. The kids became uh, instantly better when they left, um, which was bizarre because their mom and me were wondering, their mom and I were wondering why they became instantly better when they went to New Mexico when they left. Uh, they became instantly better when we went on a road trip somewhere. And the, immediate we, the minute we started living in the house again, the symptomology of all of us would, would come back again. And what he means by instantly better? What it means is, you know, they would get off the airplane and usually mom would report that they had a cold the first couple of days. 
uh, cold-like symptoms, and then they would just start improving. They would get more color in their cheeks, and generally um, their behavior would, would normalize very quickly, and you know, they would function as normal children. And the same could be said for me. When I would leave for a business trip or um, where I'd be filming, for instance, um, filming out in the clean air, uh, I would become better. I'd be more healthful. Uh, I'd get color in my cheeks again. I'd be able to think again. I would become enthusiastic, energetic. And all of that would go away after you spent a day or two in the house again. Even his fiance at the time developed her own symptoms. And in December, they started questioning if it was something in the house that made them sick. And we started looking around, but we couldn't find any evidence of anything in the house that would make us ill. By January, um, we actually started isolating certain parts of the house, and we started throwing out furniture that we suspected might be culprits. Um, of course, the furniture wasn't a culprit, but we, we were desperate to find any source because there was no visible mold in the house at all. Um, although we did notice that the cracks in the wall that I mentioned started to um, swell and get bigger, and especially in January when we had all of that rain, we were noticing that the, the walls of the house uh, were damp to the touch. Um, one area by the front window, um, the cracks had developed, and clearly something was going wrong with, with uh, the roof and the ability for water to leak in. It took eight to nine months to finally figure out what happened. So that's when I notified the landlord um, that um, we suspected the house was making us sick. At the time, we said it's either mold or bacteria. And uh, we suspected that the problem is probably underneath the house because we've checked the entire house. We can't visibly see it. So um, the, uh, and we also reported another in a series of plumbing breaks. So the landlord came over, um, had a heated discussion with the plumber, uh, told us that we had to basically fix the bathroom, but didn't tell us why, and uh, told us we would send, he would send over a painter to cover up the new cracks that had suddenly formed in the front room. Not subtly, but slowly. Dr. Gary Ordog says all of their symptoms point to toxic mold, which can start out as just a cold or flu and become more serious, dizziness, nausea, memory loss, and even behavior problems. The mold usually comes from a building. So there would be a history of uh, water intrusion into the building, usually. And that would you know, involve either a flood or a pipe rupturing or uh, the roof leaking or you know, some obvious water intrusion that makes the materials in the building wet. And then uh, after several days of uh, the building materials being wet, then mold can start to grow. So there's, there may either be a history of water intrusion or the mold may actually be visible. Uh, you know, it's, it's stains on the walls, stains on the ceiling, stains on the carpeting, for example. Or you may be able to smell the mold, you know, as a musty or mildewy smell. Uh, which is a good sign that there's uh, mold growing or has been mold growing inside the building. Uh, most people are, are toxic from mold. So it, it happens in the building, so usually the home or the work sites the most common places that this occurs. Um, so there has to be water added to the building. There has to be water intrusion. Now, sometimes the water intrusion may be a small you know, pipe leak uh, inside a wall, so it may not always be visible. But if proper testing is done, then the mold can be found inside the walls. Um, but if there is uh, like a small pipe leak inside a wall, then you may have a musty smell, you know, in the home, especially if the building's sealed up, you know, you, and you open it up and go in from a vacation, for example. If you smell that musty, moldy smell, then it indicates there's a problem. The landlord had apparently not told them there were any problems with the house before they moved in. And when I first moved in, I specifically asked him, are there any, you know, roof leaks in this house? And I don't know why I asked that question other than maybe I suspected there had been. And his answer was no, the house had been re-roofed, there were no roof leaks. Which we now know is correct that it had been re-roofed, we have evidence of that, but that the re-roofing uh, was completely uh, ineffectual. I mean, the house had roof leaks throughout. In fact, when we, when the landlord came over um, to look at the plumbing and told me he was going to bring a painter over, I brought up my video camera and decided to take my fingernail and pick away a little bit at the uh, cracks that had developed in the front wall. And I have, I have it all on videotape. The wall completely caved away in my hands um, and crumbled to the floor, basically. 
and um, we don't know what the black substance was coming out of the wall at the time. We suspect it was a combination of wood rot, mold, and um, and termites. But the uh, wall just basically completely crumbled and disintegrated. The landlord's plumber came over, or painter, handyman, came over two hours later and completely patched up the evidence um, very well, I must say. But we asked him, aren't you going to do anything about the cause? And he said, this is what I was told to do, which is basically to completely conceal an area that I have videotape showing was rotted to the core in our front living room next to where we ate dinner every night. So that's, and then the house had this horrible sort of smell, and all of our symptoms became worse. Uh, because of, uh, we presume, what happened underneath the house with the plumbing. So that's when I went ahead and I put up notices on the house, and I called the landlord and I said, look, I don't know what's going on here, but in all respect, um, all due respect, please do not do any more repairs. Don't fix the bathroom like you said you were going to. Stop everything until I find out how to make my family. Stop everything until I find out how to make my family safe. And so all work was basically ceased, the landlord began to panic, and I began to get investigators in there to find out what the hell was in that house. KPFK News contacted Burbank Property Associates, who owns the house, but the man who answered the phone would not identify himself and said he could not comment because of pending litigation. At the time I called, a lawsuit had not been filed, but he still would not discuss the house because he thought there was a possibility of a lawsuit. And because Arsenault had gotten the same brush off, he started bringing in people who identify termites in the house because termites are associated with mold. He brought over an air sampling specialist who identified mold that was many times the level acceptable for human beings. And an inspector with the County of Los Angeles also went to look at the house. After all the things I just described, came to the house, shown a flashlight in the crawl space, walked into the house, sniffed around, looked around at the recent paint job and said, I'm sorry, if we can't see and smell mold in this house, we're going to declare it to be a clean house. So we said, wait a minute, how can you say that? There's a you know, we, we actually have videotape evidence of the mold. We have, we didn't have the air samples back, but we have compelling evidence to indicate that this house has a major problem, and you guys are basically going to, um, basically going to deem this place to be passed by your, by your standards. Um, and they said, yes, that's exactly true, and we have no intention of crawling under your house. We have no intention of doing destructive testing, air sampling, or anything. We go by sight and smell, and that's it. And then he started talking on a pretty regular basis with Barbara Paul in Senator Jack Scott's office. I finally interceded with, um, as to the point that I felt most comfortable with representing the senator, and that was just requesting that the city, um, you know, had um, their, their city inspector had sort of violated um, the procedures there and not gone about the inspection and the... Um, uh, the vacating the spot in a proper manner. So I brought it to the attention of the city manager through a letter, and um, he um, did not respond to it, but I knew he did because the, uh, you know, in an indirect manner, because of course the property owner called me. Um, the city was just not reacting the way that they should have. And then they did state in the violation uh, form that they, it was not, the place was not to be occupied. But it was occupied, and so they did not follow through with um, with their plans the way that they should have. Um, so I just really brought that to their attention, uh, stating that it was, um, you know, it certainly has been found to be hazardous to anyone's health, and that it uh, we just don't feel comfortable with the fact that other people are living in a situation where these people can become very unsuspectingly, you know, and unknowingly sick. She says the letter was all she could legally do before the Toxic Mold Protection Act came about. The problem is there's not a whole lot of laws that are in effect at this point of time regarding um, the mold. Um, so there are no city laws that they have, you know, that are in existence that they have violated regarding that mold specifically. There are some laws. There was a new legislation that has been passed and um, which is going to make things like this more easier to attack. Um, because at this point, uh, like I said, the, the, the city, city has not dealt with it. It's sort of like a new um, entity for them. So um, I think rather than, you know, 
go into it uh, full force. They don't because there just is not the laws on the book at this point. Senator Deborah Ortiz authored the Toxic Mold Protection Act, which became effective at the beginning of this year. She says the city of Burbank needed to do more. They actually have a greater responsibility if they believe there's some risk. And if their building inspectors can verify or validate or confirm the the test results, then they have an obligation to move that tenant out and declare the property uninhabitable. They have that authority now. Paul agrees the act will now help force the city's hand. I don't think that the city itself will um, certainly be doing anything regarding the mold uh, scenario until they're mandated by the state, till there is laws in effect. Um, so I don't think that on their own they're, they're going to pick this up um, because I wrote this letter several months ago and have not heard from them. But Senator Ortiz says there is one part of the legislation that would directly help in Arsenault's case. The disclosure to prospective tenants um, to identify you know, current or, or past existence of mold I think might have been the most, imp- you know, the most on-point provision of the, of the bill that he would have been affected by had it been in place when he became a tenant. After Arsenault got all of the experts and city officials out to the house, the landlord started getting an emergency order to inspect the house for prospective buyers and putting up an eviction notice. I didn't get any evidence whether they knew um, the severity of mold or they knew the mold situation, but I do have a very strong level of knowledge that they completely knew that the house was in this state because um, obviously for years they had been patching up all the cracks. They, they patched up and they actively dealt with all the conditions that would make a house completely a toxic mold habitation. Senator Ortiz says the Toxic Mold Protection Act also clarifies what happens if landlords allow new tenants to move in after there's proof of toxic mold. If the owner is on notice and if there is in fact some evidence that there is some level of mold that is unsafe and they fail to act and allow new tenants to come in, then there's certainly a a right of that subsequent tenant to raise sort of the issue of breach of warranty of habitability because it's unsafe. There are new tenants in the house on Olive Street in Burbank. The tall man who answered the door declined an interview on tape, but did say they were not suffering from any health problems. Dr. Gary Ordog says mold affects everyone in different ways. You know, every person is different. They have different enzyme systems. Um, Some of it's genetic. Uh, We're given different enzyme systems by our parents. Uh, Some are able to handle the toxins and excrete or eliminate them faster than other people. Um, You know, even diets related because, uh, you know, if you have a good uh, intake of antioxidants and a good diet, then you're maybe better able to handle these toxic molds than other people. Um, And it's all related to exposure. It's related to the dose. So, you know, some, some people living in one room may be more heavily exposed than people living in the same house but a different room. Uh, based on the dose and the types of molds that are in that one room. So there's a lot of variables involved. Which could explain why the current tenants say they've not gotten sick. After Arsenault moved out of the house, his son's symptoms went away. Even Jonathan's Tourette's disappeared, and he no longer has to take medication to control it. Dr. Gary Ordog says the best way to treat someone with toxic mold symptoms is to get them away from exposure, but there are other methods. We use various procedures to... Uh, basically detoxify the patient and one of them involves a series of uh, um, supplements that help the liver metabolize the fat soluble mycotoxin turning them into water soluble so they can be excreted from the body Uh, we've also found that uh, what we call heat depuration works that's sweating with heat like a sauna or jacuzzi or a hot tub etc there's fat that comes out in the sweat that actually contains some of the mycotoxins, so that, that has been found to help. Um, there's certain things we can do to improve the immune system because uh, one of the big factors is immune suppression from uh, these poisons from the mold. So um, we help do, do things to help the immune system uh, treat the infections that are associated with this.
And often they need uh, antifungal agents. They're sort of like antibiotics that are used to uh, kill the mold that's uh, growing in the body. Then he has to retest to make sure it's been killed, and it's not coming back. People can become worse for several reasons. One is being re-exposed, because once you become sick from this, if you're re-exposed, it takes very little to, to make you worse. Also, if... You know, there's a certain point where some of the damage becomes permanent, and then it's uh, really hard to get a recovery from that. You know, especially if you know if you've had several years of exposure causing neurological damage, uh, it's difficult for the brain to recover once it's been permanently injured. So then there's also a point where cells start dying in the body from the from the mold toxins and you can develop antibodies to certain components of those cells looking like an autoimmune disease. Some people can become extremely sensitive to both these chemicals and then further chemicals and they can develop multiple chemical sensitivities you know which will make them worse so they become very sensitive to not only mold but to other chemicals as well. Some people their immune systems become so damaged that uh, you know they get recurrent infections and and you know, it's a real battle to improve their immune system. Sometimes we have to replace their immune systems artificially. After being evicted, Arsenault says he and his family could not even stay in hotels because of the low levels of toxic mold. So we ultimately lived in a tent for about two months this summer. Um, it was the best thing for us. We were able to completely detoxify at night, breathing in fresh, natural air. And then at work, we would go to work, we would... We would dump a gallon of water on our head and shampoo our hair, uh, put on deodorant, shave, put on our uh, clothing, and go to work and uh, get on the phone and act like a normal person. And, and then I'd go back home to uh, Castaic Lake Campground. Um, we would, um, you know, get ready for bed and go to sleep where all the vacationers were and then go, repeat it again and again. It was the only way that we started healing. Prior to that, we were moving around from hotel to hotel, spending, you know, $2,000 a month on hotel bills, and no matter where we went, there was some low level of mold that would trigger our responses. Senator Ortiz says the family should not have had to be homeless. With or without the law, but made easier with this new bill in place, the bill makes it very clear that um, in a tenant situation that there are persons who are now in, clearly empowered to go in and determine whether the tenant residential um, location is is unsafe or uninhabitable, um, which then would entitle him to tenant relocation benefits because the situation is unsafe. And Arsenault says when he discovered their brand new van had mold, he told his insurance company about it. USAA sort of was incredulous and they said, how can a truck be contaminated just by carrying your possessions? Everybody asked that. Even I asked that because we removed everything from the truck. We stripped the carpeting out. We took the chair out of the truck. We cleaned everything with antifungals. It was just bare metal in that truck. And yet still, every time we entered it, we couldn't drive it. We would get dizzy. We would sneeze. Our skin would burn. And USAA sent out a testing company that measured very, very high levels of mold inside the truck. And the only explanation can be that the mold is so insidious, and we know it is, that the mold traveled into basically the air conditioning and the other nooks and crannies of the truck and was just living there, even despite the hot sunshine and so forth. And so they decided to, USA, this is unprecedented, um, they, they compensated us for the truck and they salvaged it, and I was told they were going to crush the truck. No human being was ever to enter the truck again. USAA did pay the claim but decided to clean the truck, which Arsenault says is not a good idea. Senator Ortiz says insurance, especially homeowners, is the weakness in this new legislation. We really managed to deal with some very, very strong interest groups that were at the table on this bill the real estate industry, the uh, apartment association, the chamber of commerce, the consumer attorneys, and to have thrown insurance coverage into the mix this year would have been the poison pill to kill even this proposal, which went further than I think imagined it was going to you know, go in one year. So certainly the next frontier to tackle is, in fact, that question of insurance policies and um you know, this thing that they're using called a um, pollution exclusion. I mean, they're just summarily excluding 
coverage for these kinds of cases and saying, oh, well, this is an environmental or a pollution exclusion, therefore we're not going to um, uh, you know, honor the claims. And that is a very, very, um, very important um, industry and lobby in the legislature, and that is going to be a battle into itself if we ever approach that one. But she says the Toxic Mold Protection Act will change current laws. The disclosure requirement, I mean, if they can show that the landlord knew that there was mold in there prior to them entering into the tenancy arrangement, and they failed to disclose, and that's a breach, that's a violation. It would require some education of the landlord and tenant arrangement to be on the lookout for things that might result in mold, ongoing water intrusion. It would you know, reiterate a duty for the tenant to be, a, you know, a, a good tenant as well as a landlord to be a responsive landlord to remedy those situations. And this is just further refinement that, that mold would constitute one of those instances of that required not only disclosure but um, would, you know, allow certain remedies to, uh, certain benefits to accrue to the tenant if the landlord failed to, to disclose and failed to maintain. Arsenault says he's glad there's finally legislation that says you cannot have a house be a toxic house because getting sick from mold is a ridiculous way to live. I mean, you're not just homeless when mold gets you. You are literally destroyed. Every aspect of your life is destroyed. Your cognitive functions are completely disabled. You generally lose all of your money because you've been spending it on doctors and so forth, and you've been spending it on trying to keep alive. Um, you lose your vehicles, you lose all your clothing, you lose all your possessions, no one will help you, everybody pursues you, and you ultimately have to live in a sterile, completely sterile environment, which we currently do live in. We live in a brand new apartment, never lived in before by a human. And it sounds crazy, you become a Howard Hughes. Arsenault says when you become a true toxic mold victim, it's difficult even walking through the produce aisle at the supermarket because he can smell the mold in water and even potatoes with its tiny hint of mold can make his skin crawl. I was making six figures before I moved into this house. I was well on the way to buying a house, to building up my career again. I was making, I was a network television editor making money in the industry as well as money on my own and my own business. And I was doing wonderfully well. And by moving into this house, I lost my entire video library, which I had to sell at a great discount to a distributor to try to pay for some of the medical expenses. And uh, obviously, I left my job at E directly to deal with the symptoms my son was having, unbeknownst to me, was being chased by the school district by their draconian school police trying to find out where my children were sleeping. Uh, They didn't give a rat's ass that we were now not only homeless, but we had lost everything we owned. All of my doctors before I met Dr. Ordog didn't know how to treat me. I wrote letters and letters and letters, and we saw all these different specialists trying to find out how do we get the toxins out of our body, which the doctors looked at us like like we were... We had discussed something that didn't even exist in the journals of medicine. Dr. Ordog says there are about 280 symptoms that can be caused by toxic mold, obviously too many to go over. But it can be scientifically proven, and now with the new Toxic Mold Protection Act in place, it will be easier to go after landlords who won't clean up or demolish a piece of property that can be deadly. Special thanks to producer Andrew Evans. I'm Katie Chen for KPFK.